I think the scripture reading this morning it was just perfect considering who's providing our leadership because the words, um, they've always meant a lot to me and I think this morning what we're hearing is that our children have grown in wisdom and in God's grace. And so um, I'd like to thank all of our people for being part of the service this morning. And we're going to have our message brought to us from Brielle Hone, who's a sophomore at Cornell University. And she's going to tell us about her mission trip this summer to the Philippines. And I'm going to turn it over to Brielle. Good morning. Good morning. So as Kathleen said, um, I'm Brielle. I'm a current sophomore at Cornell studying chemical engineering. Um, and I had the unique e experience to uh, participate in the Global Justice Volunteers Program this summer in the Philippines. But before I get into that, I want to thank you for all for making this experience possible for me. It was through your support, both financially and spiritually, that I was able and ready to participate in the Global Justice Volunteers Program. So let me start by reading you our focus verse that we used for our time there. It comes from John 10.10. 10. I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. So here I was at the beginning of my journey, ready to bring an abundant life to the Filipinos. I had thought I had come to help the people and to work towards bringing them justice. And while on some level that was true, I had no idea where God's path would truly bring me. I worked in Luzon, the northern part of the Philippines, um, mostly there. Uh, I did make it out of the city a couple times, saw the beach once. Mostly where I was working was in Manila, um, the capital city, and the surrounding urban poor areas. I was assigned to work with the Board of Women's Work, um, which makes it hard to cover everything I did there because uh, the Board of Women's Work covers a lot of different organizations that work with women. But let me try to cover some of the stories of uh, my time there. One of the first places we visited was the urban poor community of Paranaque. The community will not exist after 2016, as it is scheduled to be demolished to make way for new flood prevention structures. While some of my group had visited before during the training session, this was my first experience there. The smell was overwhelming at times. It was a rotten odor that pervaded every corner of the community. The streets were narrow pathways that wound in seemingly unrecognizable patterns. It would be easy to get lost in there. Um, luckily, we had someone leading us through. We were given a chance to meet one of the families there. Uh, the woman we met was Tita Rose, and while her husband worked on a boat motor behind us, we were able to ask her questions with the help of our Tagalog-speaking friend. Tita Rose used to work as a seamstress, but went blind in one eye and was unable to stay employed. Her husband runs boats up and down the river fishing to make a living. That suffices for most of the year, but after storms, the river is too churned up to fish and income becomes short. There's a plan to relocate them to another community, but there's no river there, which begs the question, how is a fisherman supposed to fish without a river? Tita Rose had several children. She was proud of them when I asked about their graduation pictures that hung on the wall. Some older children poked their heads down from the upper room while we were there. This was a family that, despite barely making enough money to buy the drinking water, put food on the table, was a loving family. Sure, they didn't have an abundance of physical things, but God provided what they needed. This was a family that gladly took me into their home and welcomed me to take a glimpse into their life. And I saw how abundant it truly was, despite the scarcity of physical comforts that I was so accustomed to. We also had the opportunity to visit some political prisoners in the women's prison. Political prisoners are people that are jailed usually wrongfully for working against the government. The charges against them range from treason to murder and kidnapping. After being ushered into the overcrowded cell block, the women excitedly gathered benches and stools for us to sit with them. We were the first foreigners to visit them. They shared stories of the charges placed against them. One woman had been there for two years without actually being convicted of anything um, because the government did not have money to transport her to a courthouse to be tried. So she remained there in jail. 
One of the women shared a story of how she lost her baby because there was not adequate medical care provided to her. In fact, we actually sat outside what they considered to be the infirmary, which did not even have running water. These conditions were barely livable, but the women we met couldn't be happier. They wore yellow t-shirts calling for their freedom, freeing all political prisoners. They gave us these cards that they had decorated and drawn on, it says free all political detainees. They gave us um, each a beaded bracelet and a beaded rose that they made, things that probably took hours. They were so willing to give us what, of what little they had they carried this hope of justice that could not be stopped by cell walls. Praying with them afterwards was really something special. One of the other major issues we looked at um, in the Philippines was forced migration. There's a lack of infrastructure to create the jobs necessary to employ all the Filipinos. So 28% of the population is unemployed or underemployed. The Philippines export around 5,000 people a day to work in other countries, a day. And that's only the documented workers. Human trafficking is a big issue and the Filipino uh, government is failing to address it. Human trafficking is basically modern day slavery where workers are exploited in bad conditions or for no pay or both. Um, and it's not just the sex trafficking, it is a lot of labor trafficking, and it comes with the territory of exporting so many people. Uh, there's just not enough resources to keep track of everything. Um, so because there's so much money to be made, there's a lot of corruption and very little help for the migrant workers in distress. If I was in the Philippines and I always had a problem, I could go to my embassy. The U.S. Embassy would help me. But they don't have that. Um, some of the, I think it's the embassy in Somewhere in the Middle East, is the next plot over is just a camp of Filipino workers waiting to get home because they can't get, um, I guess, their passports stamped to come home. We heard from many survivors of human trafficking the four times we visited Migrante International, an organization that advocates for the rights of migrant workers and works to educate the migrants about their rights. It was great to hear their stories, yet scary to think that so many more are not that lucky. Six to 10 Filipino workers arrive back in the Philippines in coffins every day. Workers can be exploited and forced to work ridiculous hours with little food and sleep. There were several horror stories we heard about all the experiences the human trafficking victims had. And human trafficking doesn't just occur in the Philippines. Workers are exploited in several countries, including the United States. We spoke with a woman, Trixie, who was trafficked in Florida at, the resort, at a resort. Um, she was forced to work there. She was uh, put into this little tiny home with lots of other uh, Filipinos that were brought over. She was not paid um, adequately, um, and they took her passport away. So she was forced to stay here. Um, Gary, one of the mig migrante workers, was trafficked in South Korea. He worked long hours with little sleep, and only one cup of rice per day was provided to him, and the paycheck never came as promised. Even here in Medford, human trafficking is a problem, with the recent problem of underpaying workers at the uh, Medford Nursery a couple months back. And yet, despite this common thread of injustice, everyone we met had hope, had smiles, these issues, poverty, human trafficking, are really big and seemingly insurmountable. These stories I carry with me are horrible. No human should have to go through these things. These people I encountered had lives that were ravaged by injustice. And yet, when I was there, they welcomed me in to hear their stories with hope and smiles, two things I never expected to see. Despite the fact that they lived in extreme poverty or had been trafficked, they still had an abundant life. I came to realize I wasn't the one bringing abundant life to these people. Jesus had already done that. In some cases, their lives seemed more abundant than my own, filled not with earthly possessions, but with love and family and faith. And not even the worst injustices can take faith away. I think it was harder for me to fully grasp why my presence with the people I met brought hope. 
Early on in the mission trip, I realized that I was actually fairly useless when it came to solving these gigantic injustices. This was hard because I wasn't able to do anything tangible in my time there. But I was a really good listener. I listened to dozens of people's stories. It wasn't my ability to solve these injustices that the people faced that brought them hope. It was my willingness to listen. They left knowing someone cared, and I left as a changed person, carrying their stories with me so that I might pass them on to others. Change doesn't happen overnight, nor does it come from a single person in a single summer. I got to attend a workshop on uh, social justice at the youth convocation that was being held in the Philippines. There, the woman leading the workshop uh, spoke on how important connections were to solving these big problems. So by talking about the issues I care about with you, maybe it will spark the connections necessary to help chip away at these injustices. I want to leave you with a story of where I found hope. Every year, the president holds a State of the Nation address, much like our State of the Union. And each year, many Filipinos gather in the streets to protest and show the ineffectiveness in the government and working for its people. Knowing that we were not allowed to participate in anything political made me a bit wary about attending the rally in Manila. But we were there to attend the worship service in the streets before the marchers left, nothing more. Um, I actually still have the program. Uh, they held it in Tagalog with over a megaphone. But, but it, was, it was still an experience being there, you know, being a part of this. Once we arrived, I realized just how many people had come out for the event. Um, they were everywhere, slowly taking more and more lanes of the road. Um, they came from all walks of life. And the best part was that I knew and recognized so many people there, which is saying something in a foreign country. Um, I guess um, Migrante International, the migrant rights group we worked with was there. There was a group representing the indigenous people, like the Aito we visited. Um, the indigenous people there face uh, racism because they are darker skinned. Um, there was a group standing behind a handmade set of prison bars representing the political prisoners we had visited. There were people we had met at Hacienda Luisita, a giant farm where uh, the people were fighting for fair land redistribution to the people. There were people from the National, Co National Council of Churches in the Philippines, where who had hosted our training in the very beginning, and other missionaries and church people that we recognized. On top of that, there were labor groups, there were women groups, there were professional groups. Everyone was represented in this protest. This wasn't a problem faced by a few Filipinos. This was a problem faced by an entire country. After joining a worship service led by a megaphone and witnessing the growing crowd, Nicole, my fellow GJV, and I asked if we could stay and walk with the people. We got the green light and were briefed by the legal team. After a surge of foreigner presence at the protest last year, the police were on the lookout and could be taking pictures of us. However, there's nothing illegal about being a tourist on a tourist visa. So while we were told it was unwise to walk in the protest, we were allowed to walk alongside and take pictures like a tourist. So with my camera at the ready, we set along the route. We weren't able to go all the way because there were often physical altercations when the police barriers were reached. When we got close, we walked up over the overpass to the other side of the road. From there, we could see the police line and all the police down the road, uh, down the median of the road as well. But you could also see the long line of people back along the route and in front of us as well. And there were even more arriving throughout the day. To see so many people gathered for the same cause was very inspiring. This was hope. Hope for a future where no Filipino would have to face the injustices I had witnessed. Hope that the people who cared would be able to make a difference. Never before had I felt my presence was so necessary. I hope that you can take these stories I've shared with you and start a dialogue. Share these stories with others. Talk with me about them, because I have so many more stories I could share. Hope for these people lies in other people's actions. I couldn't solve these problems in a summer by myself. 
But I, my hope is that maybe something sparked your interest. Maybe something I said here will encourage you to attend um, the information session about the upcoming mission trip in the Dominican Republic. Maybe it means you will financially support those going on missions or charities that work to bring justice to the oppressed. Or maybe it means you will add the Filipino people to the end of your prayer list. Whatever it is, I hope these stories remind you that even in the darkest of situations, God provides and God brings hope. I came in thinking that ex in extreme poverty, behind bars, or being oppressed, one could not find an abundant life. But abundant life is something I encountered every day there. Faith in Jesus led to an abundant life filled with hope. And I was just blessed to be a part of these people's lives for the short time I was there. Thank you again to everybody who made this uh, mission possible. And if you want to hear more about my mission trip, you can check out the blog I kept um, at briellehone.blogspot.com. Thank you.